Hello, I'm Mark Forsyth, and this is lesson number two on how to write English verse. If you haven't seen lesson number one, go back and watch lesson number one. This lesson will make no sense unless you've seen lesson number one on the Ambic Pentameters. You'll be able to find that on the same YouTube channel or the same Instagram channel, I think, if I understand Instagram, which I don't. Or you can find it on the Inky Fool blog, which is blog.inkyfool.com. If you've learned the Ambic Pentameter in the last one, then this lesson will be incredibly simple because last time we did the Ambic Pentameter, which Sorry, which is five to tums in a row, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum. And this time we're going to do the iambic tetrameter, which is just four to tums in a row. It really is that simple. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. That's it, four to tums in a row, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum. In case you're wondering, just on the technical language that I've been using, I know it's boring, but uh, the technical name for to tum is an iamp, and when you have five in a row, that's a pentameter, the same as pentagon, the same pent, and when you have tetrameter, that's four, because tetra is Greek for four, as in tetrahedron, or something like that. So um, usually the iambic tetrameter is a little bit lighter and more lyrical than the um, iambic pentameter, but you can use it to write big, grand things. The Daffodils poem was by William Wordsworth, but his friend Samuel Taylor Coleridge used it to write exactly the same, to tum to tum to tum to tum In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So you can use it for almost anything. The one thing that makes the iambic tetrameter a little bit more complicated than pentameter is that it has to rhyme. And the reason for that is quite odd, but it's very just the w way we naturally speak English. Naturally, if you're reciting iambic pentameters, you will quite naturally leave a tiny little gap, one beat gap at the end of each line, which marks the ending of the line. So you have once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or fill the gap up with our English dead. In peace says nothing so becomes a man, etc, etc, etc. With a tetrameter, when you're naturally, when you're reciting it, you will just go straight over into the next line. So if you don't have a rhyme, there's nothing to mark the ending of uh, the lines. So if you can imagine a poem that went, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on higher hills and lakes, when all at once I saw a field, a host of golden daffodils. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work as a poem. So it has to rhyme. And so therefore, it's slightly harder to improvise in this because you have to um, improvise in rhyme. But the trick to improvising in uh, rhyme is make your first line end with a really easy rhyme, like I or E or A or something, because sky has lots and lots of rhymes like fly and high. Whereas if you end the first line with a word like hinge, the second line you'll end up desperately trying to work in a reference to a syringe or something like that. But um, basically get the rhythm in your head and you'll end up writing lines like, had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime, we would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. So uh, that's simple, that's the tetrameter. And because that's so simple, um, you may well be thinking now and wondering to yourself, well, if you can do five and you can do four, then surely you can do six or three or 17. And of course you can, there's no law against it, there's no police that will pull you over and take your poetic license away. But in the whole history of English literature, basically no one's ever managed to write a good hexameter, that's six to tums in a row. Occasionally the trimeter, the three to tums people have managed, but it doesn't work much. The other great English meter is an alternating one. It's four, then three. Four to tums, then three to tums, then four to tums, then three to tums. So it goes to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tea, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tum, to tea. The time has come, the walrus said, that's four, to talk of many things, that's three, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether fish have wings. It uh, works very nicely. You can do it for a lovely nonsense poem like The Walrus and the Carpenter, but you can also do it for very serious stuff. Um, Emily Dickinson only ever wrote in the ballad meter. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves in immortality. Uh, Oscar Wilde used it right for the ballad of Reading Jail. Well, he was a prisoner in, you guessed it, Reading Jail. For each man kills the thing he loves, by each let this be heard. Some do it with a flattering look, some with a bitter word. Uh, 
It's great, it's got this lovely trundling momentum, and again, you can just learn to improvise in it, get it um, just so it flows out of you, and um, that is that. And if you're thinking, well, today's lesson was really very, very simple, that's because English verse is really very, very simple, and so am I. Next lesson, we shall be doing trochees and anapes and dactyls, which are just complicated names for very simple things. Um, until then, I'm going to don my protective mask, and sink back into my lonely lockdown. Remember, masks save lives.